I think one of the most important goals of an introductory organic chemistry course should be when you get to more advanced coursework, whether it's in laboratory organic chemistry or biochemistry, we want you to have the feeling that you've been there before, you have seen this before in some form. Via analogic reasoning, we want you to be able to reach back in time to an example of a reaction or a mechanism or a synthetic sequence that you've seen previously and realize, I've seen this kind of chemistry before. I've seen electrons moving, moving this way. I've seen bonds reorganizing themselves this way. I've seen electrons within a structure distributed in this way before. And in this video, I really want to drive this home by looking at places where imines and enamines come up in advanced organic chemistry settings as well as biochemistry. And this first slide touches on structures that you may see in more advanced organic chemistry courses regularly. And we've already seen some of these structures, in, in fact, already. Um, substituted benzenes, amino benzenes, anilines, contain an enamine structure built in. And the enamine involves a CC double bond in the benzene ring and the attached amino group, the attached NH2. That is an enamine, right? And we can push electrons just like we would in any enamine to show that the ortho and para carbons with respect to where that NH2 is attached are nucleophilic. We've seen this previously in earlier discussions of aromatic substitution, right? And distributions of electrons and substituted aromatics. But now we can use the language of enamines to think about it, right? We can think about that ortho carbon as an alpha carbon of an enamine, right? And the same thing happens in aromatic heterocycles. So for example, parole contains an embedded enamine within it, and we can push electrons just like we did in this case, starting with that good electron donor, the nitrogen atom, and pushing over to carbon to see that that carbon, which looks like an alpha carbon of an enamine, is nucleophilic. So the exact same type of electron flow is going on there, and in even more complicated heterocycles, bicyclic heterocycles, right, fused aromatic heterocycles. You see the same kind of electron flow being extremely important for understanding the distribution of electrons in that structure and how it's going to react. For example, this reacting as a nucleophile should make perfect sense if you can spot the embedded enamine in this structure. On the other side of the coin, imines and aminium ions also show up in aromatic heterocycles. And pyridine is sort of the classic example containing a built-in conjugated Imine. So the CN double bond, well, that's an imine, and we can push the electrons in the CN double bond to nitrogen to create a polarized structure that shows us that the carbon ortho to the pyridine nitrogen is electrophilic. And you know what? This looks a lot like an imine carbon, which we've already talked about being analogous to a carbonyl carbon, so it's no surprise that, that carbon is a pretty good electrophile. And if we attach a leaving group to it, right, something like a chlorine, that's going to be highly amenable to nucleophilic substitution. We've seen pyridines in nucleophilic aromatic substitutions in the past. If we protonate at the pyridine nitrogen, well now we've just supercharged the electrophilicity of that carbon because we've created an aminium ion right here. And through exactly analogous electron flow to what we just did, we could push these electrons onto nitrogen. That would put positive charge here and we could see that this carbon is even more electrophilic in the protonated pyridine or pyridinium because of its aminium-like nature right here. So if you go on and take, for example, a heterocyclic chemistry course, Dr. Phil Barron's heterocyclic chemistry course is amazing. You should totally take it. And I'm going to link to his video series actually from this video on YouTube. But if you go take that course, seeing these embedded amines and enamines is going to help you a ton to understand not only how these react, but also where they come from. Right? The idea that we can make pyridine through a condensation reaction that establishes this CN double bond, that's useful to know for synthetic purposes. And for parole, even better. Right, Similar kind of condensation chemistry can be used to make the parole ring. And this is the bread and butter of making heterocycles, these imine and enamine type condensations. In the remainder of this video, I want to look at an important biochemical example of a compound that can form imines and that actually contains an embedded aminium ion and see how an understanding of the chemistry of imines and aminiums really helps us get a handle on what's going on 
with this molecule and why it's such a useful cofactor. So the specific chemistry here is not so important. You know, what are the reactants? What are the products? It's the general idea that fundamental organic chemistry ideas about imines and enamines can help us understand what's going on here and rationalize why the chemistry works the way it does. So the cofactor we're going to look at is called pyridoxal phosphate, or PLP. It's an oxidized form of vitamin B6, and it contains an aldehyde functional group. It also contains an embedded imenium ion right here in this pyridinium ring, and that's worth noting. That's going to become important to us a little bit later. Now, with the aldehyde group in this cofactor, this can form imines with free primary amines, right, free NH2 groups, and these abound in enzymes at lysine side chains. The side chain of the amino acid lysine contains a primary amino group. So we could generally represent an enzyme here with some lysine side chain just as this sort of squiggly line. This is the rest of the enzyme. It's a massive protein molecule, but there's a little bit of it that contains a lysine side chain, and that can form an imine with PLP, and the result is what's known as a PLP imines. Uh, PLP imine. Imines are also known as shift bases, by the way. This is a term you may hear in some more old school or biochemical literature. Shift bases simply refers to the imine functional group. That's, that's it. Now, what can this imine do? Well, it may not look like much, but this can actually do a lot because what this has done is it's put this carbon sort of in resonance contact with the pyridinium ring. Notice this has created a conjugated system that extends over this whole thing. So now, positive charge, negative charge, radical character sitting right there are going to be stabilized by this huge conjugated system next door. So for example, if PLP condenses not with a lysine residue, but with an amino acid's NH2 group, similar thing can happen. For example, if an amino acid comes into the enzyme and we get like an imine exchange, where a different nitrogen comes in and displaces this nitrogen, we can get to a PLP imine that looks like this with the amino acid supplying the nitrogen of the imine. And we can ask, what's going on at this carbon that's now right next to this big conjugated system? Well, its acidity has become dramatically enhanced at that carbon highlighted in purple because if we deprotonate at that carbon, we're gonna see that we can delocalize electrons, in fact, all the way over to that positively charged nitrogen atom. So here's electron flow arrows that show this. This massively increases the acidity at that position and allows, for example, a basic side chain inside the enzyme's active site to deprotonate there and flatten out the amino acid. So this allows, for example, reprotonation from the other side to occur creating the other enantiomer of the amino acid. This is a key mechanism of PLP-dependent racemase enzymes that convert, for example, a single enantiomer of an amino acid into the opposite enantiomer or a racemic mixture. This slide shows that idea in all of its gory detail, and I'm going to go through it pretty quickly, but I encourage you to pause and carefully walk through the chemistry on your own if that's of interest to you. Um, PLP-dependent racemases, so this one, for example, converts L-alanine into its enantiomer, D-alanine, and it does this by deprotonating at this carbon. But that carbon's not that acidic on its own, right? This is a carbonyl alpha carbon, but it's alpha to a carboxylic acid and an NH2 group, so it's not terribly acidic. But as soon as we form that PLP imine, well, now it's much, much more acidic, and it can be deprotonated by a basic residue in the enzyme's active site to form this now flat reactive intermediate. It's actually still an imine, just an imine with the other carbon, the alpha carbon of the amino acid. And now reprotonation of this from the opposite side, from kind of underneath the plane of the CN double bond, if you like, places an H on the opposite side of where it started, and after hydrolysis of this imine intermediate leads to the enantiomer of the starting material. So this enzyme has accomplished a change in configuration at this carbon via formation of an imine at the NH2 group in the substrate. All kinds of electron accepting reactions involving this carbon connected to a primary amino group, an NH2 group, are enabled via formation of a PLP imine. And I wanted to highlight three more examples on this slide in addition to the racemase example that we already saw. Here, 
what's going on looks like a retroaldol reaction, actually, where we have what is a beta hydroxy carbonyl group right here going back to the carbonyl and an aldehyde. And here the aldehyde is formaldehyde. And in essence, what needs to happen is we need to accept electrons onto this alpha carbon. And via the formation of a PLP imine, we can make this happen. So the PLP imine looks something like this. Here, R plus is that pyridinium ring with positive charge in the ring. And so we know we can send electrons into that. And via essentially a retroaldol type elimination here is, is what's going on. We get now the unsubstituted amino acid, which is glycine and formaldehyde as a product. So this is a retroaldol reaction enabled via the uh, formation of a PLP imine. PLP is also great for retroclasin reactivity, and that's what's going on here. Notice we have a 1,3-dicarbonyl structure here, and PLP enables this to go back to the separated amino acid, here it's glycine again, and acetyl-CoA via a retroclasin type of process. So CoA adds in, and then an elimination occurs via a PLP imine. And formation of this imine is critical to give a place for those electrons to land when glycine is eliminated. Hydrolysis of that PLP imine ultimately gives glycine back here. So this is a retroclasin process where formation of a PLP imine enables an elimination. And finally here we have a decarboxylation. So what's going on in this reaction? CO2 has disappeared and been replaced with a new hydrogen at the carbon adjacent, or linked to rather, the NH2 group. So here again we have electron accepting reactivity occurring at a carbon that is adjacent to an NH2 group. Formation of a PLP imine at that carbon allows the carboxyl group to be deprotonated and elimination to occur with those electrons headed into the PLP imine as we've seen, and the result is just an amine actually on that side of the molecule. The CO2H group on the left is just kind of along for the ride here. So this is PLP enabling decarboxylation. All three of these involve electron acceptance at this carbon highlighted in red. And that's actually worth pausing and reflecting on to see the power of PLP imine formation for doing this. It comes up again and again and again and almost anywhere where you see PLP as a cofactor, this is something you should be thinking about. At the end of the day though, it just comes back to fundamental organic chemistry on some level, right? Formation of an imine creates a conjugated system connecting a positively charged group with an atom that sort of wants to or can accept electrons as a result of that connection. Fundamental organic chemistry guides biochemical reactions. I've got one more example of PLP serving a critical role in forming an imine with an NH2 group, and it involves the biosynthesis of cysteine from serine and acetyl coenzyme A. So uh, cysteine is the amino acid with an SH, uh, HSCH2 group linked to the alpha carbon of the amino acid. Serine has an OH. CH2 group. So we need something like a nucleophilic substitution of SH- minus for OH- minus to occur right there, but of course this mechanism is not something we're going to be able to do in a biochemical system. So the way this works in biochemical systems is we first isolate the serine hydroxyl group. This is just a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction <laughs> at the end of the day. And then PLP gets involved and forms a PLP imine with that isolated serine and we get that here. What this does again is it enhances the acidity of this proton right here connected to the alpha carbon and so now elimination of acetate becomes possible and this was kind of the motivation behind the isolation in the first place was putting something here that could act as a leaving group, take a pair of electrons and the CO bond with it and be relatively stable and thanks to the acidification of this alpha proton via the PLP imine this elimination is, is enabled. And now something like H2S quote unquote can come in and add to this electrophilic carbon. Notice it's a beta carbon, part of an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl functionality. And so it can add in there. That's a conjugate addition type of reactivity. And ultimately we get HS replacing HO in the original serine, if you like. So this is how cysteine is biosynthesized after hydrolysis of this PLP. I mean, the net result being the replacement of OH in serine 
with SH and cysteine. 